Good morning. Well, I sh in this case, I should say good afternoon and welcome to Coffee with the Rich. Although I don't have a cup of coffee here, I've already drank it before I got to the studio. But today I'm joined with uh, the legend Ed Morales for round two. And if you missed round one, you need to go back and check that out. Uh, we're going to kind of pick up where we left off. But before we do, if you're new to Coffee with the Rich, my name is Rich Brown. I'm the co host and co founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, which is America's number one self-defense podcast. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer and former police officer, and uh, I get the opportunity to, to interview amazing people like uh, Ed Morales. I'll read his bio briefly. Edmundo Morales Jr. is a retired FBI agent with 25 years of service. He served in the Washington, D.C. area, three tours in Miami, Omaha, Tucson, and two tours with the FBI Academy in Quantico. Ed worked in a variety of areas, including program management as a supervisor, classified government programs, general and violent crime investigations, organized crime investigations, narcotics investigations, undercover operations, south of the border initiative, crime scene investigations, interviewing interrogation, counterterrorism, counterterrorism bombing investigations, threat assessment, data collection, reporting of criminal and security incidents, firearms training, and street survival training. Ed has over 15 years of undercover experience, having worked scores of high risk uh, cases. Ed also deployed to Iraq, which hopefully we'll get into today, as well as training and mentoring in Mexico and Belize. Ed served four years prior to his time in the Bureau with the United States Marine Corps between 1971 and 1975. And we actually went into Ed's experience uh, in round one in the Marine Corps, which was pretty, pretty cool. And Ed has a book out called FBI Miami Firefight, Five Minutes That Changed the Bureau. And I'm going to say that it changed everything about modern uh, handgun, concealed carry, law enforcement. As I told Ed on the last show, uh, we studied it when I was in Quantico at High Risk Personnel Course. We spent an entire day breaking down this uh, gunfight. And then when I was in the police academy, we spent considerable time on it as well. So this changed everything about uh, how we think about firearms and gunfighting today and tactics for that matter. Will is on. Guile is on in the Philippines. Kevin is on. Tony says, uh, just happened to see this. Good afternoon from Brunswick, Georgia. Good afternoon, Tony. Please like and share. Ed, sir, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Rich. It's good to be back. It is a pleasure, sir. And I if you watched round one, you know that Ed kind of explained to us his time in the Marine Corps. We discussed how he got into the Bureau, and we went on that journey with Ed describing how he led up to that fateful day, April the 11th, 1986. And Ed had just described how, um, who was the gentleman that survived the shooting in the face? Uh, uh, that was uh, Jose Calazo. Jose Calazo, right. So, Jose had been shot in the face, left for dead by Platinum Maddox. He walked down a long dirt road, finally flagged somebody down and escaped. And now you know from his testimony who the killers were, what kind of vehicle they're driving, and if you would pick it up from there, sir. Sure thing. Uh, just to bring the, uh, the listeners up to speed, uh, Jose Calaza was driving a black uh 1982 uh uh oh, Monte Carlo, uh, wasn't it? Carlo, I forgot forgot the model <laughs> with the Florida tag NTJ891. So um we uh we had the description of the car, the tag, and then uh, based on the witness testimony, we had a description of two white males and a pickup truck an at Ford F F one fifty. And uh, sure enough, uh Miami being Miami um, and reporters being reporters, uh, the incident uh, appeared in the newspaper, the Miami Herald, the next the next day. Uh, <laughs> and Ben Grogan was happened to be reading the paper that uh, that morning, and he found the story and uh, read it. And then he uh, he uh, takes his hand and he just slams the desk on uh, you know in the squad area, and he goes, "This is it." this is our next robbery car, you know, and, and everybody, everybody turned around and looked at Ben, you know, says, Ben, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, this kid, this, this guy was uh, robbed in the Everglades in the same area where the, uh, the other kid was robbed and killed. 
And uh, this, the second guy survived. And he said, I guarantee you that this car is going to be our next robbery car. And, and I remember the incident, you know, we, as I may have said it before, but, you know, being the professionals that we were, you know, we looked at Ben and we said, oh, Ben, you're full of shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but Ben had the last laugh, you know, because uh, he and Steve Warner went out to the uh, Miami-Dade Hospital, um, at the Memorial Hospital, the, the trauma center down there in, uh, on, um, in central Miami and uh interviewed mr calazo and uh, got a, it got every bit of information that we could we could glean from his uh, you know confrontation and uh about a week after the incident lo and behold uh there was a robbery at 136th street and south dixie highway at a barnett bank and uh two perpetrators walked in camouflage clothing one had an assault rifle one had a revolver and um, they, as they're running out of the bank, the, um, there was a witness, a U.S. Customs uh, inspector, was going, uh, was driving up, uh, parked in the, parked in front of the bank, and was going in to cash a check. When he saw the two indiv individuals running out of the bank, you know, with, at Port Arms, <laughs> you know, with a, with a rifle, and uh, he said, "Well, you know, maybe I'll just uh, hold on a minute and wait until." I see what the heck's going on before I go in to cash my check. <laughs> so as luck would have it, the two bank robbers, or two robbers jumped into a, a black car and they backed up. And as when they backed up, the, the rear plate was right in front of the uh, customs guy's um, face. So he took down the tag, uh, black car, uh, Florida tag, and he had a pretty good description. And as it turns out, it, it was Jose Calaza's car. It was NTJ891 was the tag. So uh, we we laughed because Ben Grogan had the last laugh because he, he was right. You know, sure enough, about a week later, the uh, stolen Monte Carlo was used in a robbery. So um, we'll jump ahead three weeks. And um, on April 10, Gordon McNeil, and Ben Grogan were at firearms training. That's a Thursday. And um, Gordon asked Ben, said, hey, what do you think about setting up a surveillance tomorrow, Friday, April 11th? And uh, he said, Ben asked him why, what's up? He said, uh, well, it's called intuitive policing. You know, that's what we call it now. He told Ben, it's been three weeks since they hit. The last time they hit, they only got about $8,000 and tomorrow's friday and what does friday have to do with it is uh, uh statistically speaking based uh, on all the incidents that had occurred or, or been perpetrated by these two guys 50 percent or more were on fridays and the other balance uh, of the cases were ha were on all the other weekdays so tomorrow being friday and there was a 50 percent chance that they would hit plus the fact that it was three weeks since the last robbery and the last robbery netted them only $8,000. So Gordon said, hey, I think they're due. It's a hunch, but I think they're due and I think it's worth setting up a surveillance and which is what happened. You know, so um, Ben Grogan calls the squad and uh, talks to the bank robbery coordinator, Steve Warner, and says, hey, Gordon wants to set up a surveillance, see how many guys you can you can uh, round up and, and uh, have them meet at the, um, Home Depot parking lot at uh, you know eight thirty for a briefing, you know, and that's that's how it happened. I mean, there was no there was no tip, there was no uh, informant, there was no nothing, you know. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, misconception, a lot of criticism, you know, saying, "Hey, if you guys had the information, why weren't you better prepared?" Well, because it was there was nothing. It was just a hunch. As even Gordon McNeil, uh, the supervisor, said, "It's a hunch. That's all it was." Let me ask you a question, Ed. Yep. The actions on the objective by the two uh, bad guys, Platt and Maddox, when they actually would go into the bank to rob it at, at Port Arms or whatever, what was the actions when they were in there? Were they firing shots into the ceiling? How were they threading the tellers? What was that like? Generally not. Uh, they, Whenever they were inside a building, they, they generally did not fire uh, a, a round. That was in uh, October, I believe, uh, August, September, October. And they opened up with a uh, with the Mini 14. They fired 14, 15 shots at, at the rear of, a, of an armored truck as it was driving away. So it's like, I mean, that, they did have a propensity to shoot, 
But luckily, they didn't uh, shoot inside buildings, inside banks, except for one time. And so, um, but what they would do generally is they would go in when they were inside a bank. They would go in, and as well as two individuals can control a, a, a lobby, they control the lobby. Okay. And the one time that they did fire a shot was when they had numerous uh, over probably two dozen customers in a bank. That's when they fired the shot, you know, kind of like to get everyone's attention. You know, it's a round went up into the ceiling. And you know what? In an enclosed room, you fire a rifle in, in a room like that. Yeah, that'll <laughs> that'll get your attention. Yes. But generally, they went in, controlled the scene. One would, would watch the, the, uh, the lobby, the crowd. The, the second one would jump the, uh, the teller uh, islands and um, go in the back and, you know, rifle through the the drawers or grab the uh, the money bags in the back uh, or what, what whatever the circumstances were. But one controlled and was overwatched. The other one was the the gopher. And did, did you ever see any indication uh, as you looked back on, on it that, that they were doing advanced reconnaissance of these banks? Well, based on their actions, um, there, there was um, – an incident that happened uh, the the in January no November in November they had there were two robberies in one day I believe I forget the date but they had they had to have had prior knowledge because they knew exactly when the uh, armored truck deliveries were, were was going to be made at, at, at a at a specific bank because when they went in they specifically asked the teller. They said, who's the head teller? So, you know, the, you know, the other, you know, helper tellers ratted her out right away. She's the one, she's the one. <laughs> Much to the chagrin of the head teller, you know. So uh, so they grabbed her and said, okay, you blankety blank, you know, tell me what I want to know or I'll kill you. Of course, what, you know, okay, sure. You know, so uh, they specifically asked her, where are the money bags that the that armored truck just dropped off? Okay, specifically, mm -hmm. they either had been had had were observing and and uh, you know watching surveilling the bank, or they had prior information as to more or less what, what time the uh, the deliveries were. So, I mean, they, they they did do some homework. It wasn't just totally random, you know, hits here and there. And one final question um, on on these two guys. <laughs> Well, basically, your caseload, I guess, would be a better way to phrase it, Ed. You know, was this one of many bank bank robberies that you were working uh, at that time, or were you solely focused on these robbers? No. Again, as I, I had previously previously mentioned, we had uh, before these two uh, these two guys showed up, we had two active gangs in Miami. I mean, very active. We called them the Cuban Gang and the Black Gang. For, for lack of a better term, because we didn't know who they were either. You know, we, at least we had a, a, a general description, you know, they were Hispanic males or black males. But uh, up until uh, Jose Calazo saw these guys, we didn't know whether we were dealing with black, white, or, or uh, brown males, you know. So, um, so um, we had other, we had other gangs out there. And, and every day of the week, there was also like your, your average garden variety bank robbery, you know, so. I mean, there were still bank robbers out there, you know, so uh, some were sort of professional, others were amateur, you know, so um, you could tell right away, you know, almost, um, you know, somebody walked in, you know, stumble bummed around, you know, had a, had a little crappy little note or, you know, <laughs> screwed up the, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, what am I supposed to say now? Oh, yeah, put your hands up. Okay, now what's next? You know, yeah. <laughs> others were like, boom, you know, very professional, boom, 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 right there, you know, and um you know, we 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 did have some. I guess you would call them serial bank robbers. You know, so um, a lot of caseload, a lot of work. And in addition to that, we had fugitive cases. We handled, um, you know, we handled uh, uh, simply calls fugitive cases. You know, we had um, people that were wanted in other parts of the country. For some reason, a lot of them migrated to Florida, especially in the winter. I guess you know they were snowbirds all over the place. You know, so. <laughs> Now, so I, I just bring that up because to your point about, you know, people, you know, pointing their finger in hindsight going, why weren't you more prepared? Hey, this was just one day of many, yeah. one case of many cases, yeah. you know, and, and we're just meeting at the Home Depot parking lot and here we are. 
Yep. Yeah, that was pretty much it. You know, and again, you know, I, the biggest criticism we had was uh, I think people had a misconception saying, hey, if you were out there that day on a surveillance, then you must have had a tip. You must have had an informant. You, you must have had something to have led you out there. And you know what? I'd say nine times out of 10, that's probably correct. You know, I mean, under, you know, normal circumstance, maybe eight, eight times out of 10. But on this particular uh, case, uh, in this particular instance, Nothing. Gordon McNeil, just intuitive policing. He said, hey, I've got a hunch, Ben. I got a hunch. And, you know, just based on what I know, what I've seen, you know, and, and the, you know, what day of the week it is, I think, you know, they're due. They're, you know, and that was it. Was he the senior agent? Ed? Ed? He was the supervisor. He was the supervisor. McNeil okay. was the supervisor. Uh, ben Grogan was the senior. Uh, he was a case agent on, 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 the, uh, on the cases. Okay. So you meet up there, and was there a, a plan discussed, or what happens next? Well, you know, the, we passed out all the information available. We uh, had the um, the composite photographs that uh, or sketches that the Metro Dade County PD uh, uh, sketch artists had produced, and um, you know, those those things were uh, copied and, and passed out to the world in Southwest South Florida, all the way from uh, you know uh, Cape Canaveral and and Tampa, all the way south south, south to Key West. You know, so uh, that I mean, those those composites were passed out. The description of the black Monte Carlo, the description of the white pickup truck, and that was that was about it. That's that's about all the information we had, and other than the types of suspected weapons they had. But um, after that, you know, it's like, okay, how many guys do we have out here? Uh, you know, there were our squad consisted of about twenty agents at the time, but only fourteen agents were available to go on surveillance. Uh, on, on that Friday morning. And three of those agents were from the Homestead Resident Agency, which was a, a satellite office south of Miami. So out of the whole squad, the C1 bank robbery squad, only 11 agents out of, out of about 18 or 20 were available. I mean, it was such short notice. You know, people have court uh, hearings. They have, uh, you know, other, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, appointments, um, subpoenas or what have you sick leave, you know, annual leave, you know, people go on leave all the time, you know, people get sick. So um, we had 11 squad agents and three resident uh, agents that were assisting us for a total of 14 guys. So based on the manpower and based on the general area that we were going to surveil, which was um, anywhere from 104th Street um, on South, South Dixie Highway, all the way down to 188th Street. So based on the manpower, we decided, or the, the case agent decided, hey, listen, I'm going to set up a, our northernmost uh, team will be at 130th Street, and our southernmost team will be at 188th. So um, 100, the bank at 138th had been robbed. The bank at 136th, or the banks at 136th had been robbed. The banks at 148th had been robbed, and the banks at 188th had been robbed so that we kind of set the uh the agents on surveillance in areas that we knew had been frequented and or hit uh, by somebody in the previous uh, few weeks so that's more or less how the surveillance uh, locations were, were were picked now based on the manpower um you know, you try to divvy up, you know, the, the manpower to, to balance it out. You know, no, no one is shorthanded and no one's overstaffed, per se. So um, at 130th Street, we uh, had three agents. At 148th Street, we had three agents. And at 188th Street, we had three agents. The exception was 136th Street. Okay, that bank, there were two banks there. and they the one of the banks there had been robbed three weeks prior okay so gordon felt that you know that bank you know for some reason it seemed to attract more robberies i don't know why, what the deal was you know plus there were two banks in the same like literally in the same city block so he said hey i'm going to set five agents there it's a big parking lot you know there's, there's there's a lot of movement you know we need more eyes so he said five agents there so that's that's basically the way it was it was you know divvied up you know, so uh, three, five, three, and three. You know, so uh, that that would, you know, you you assign all your manpower. And the three agents would be uh, 
two agents in one car and one agent single in a vehicle? It varied. It depended. Okay. It, it all depended on, on the individual. You know, if you had a partner, then you had one car. Uh, if you didn't have a partner, you were solo. You know, so um, uh, at 130, the, 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 uh, for example, 136th Street, where Gordon McNeil was, he he, he was at the center of the uh, of the uh, area. Okay, he was. You know, he could respond north or respond south. You know, so whichever way he needed. Uh, at that location, you had four vehicles. Uh, one with a, one was a two-man unit, and the other three vehicles were one-man units. So, at my location, we had one two-man unit and one one-man unit. So it, it just depended on on who was available, you know, uh, the availability of cars and so on. And you were in a were you in a vehicle with Hanlon? Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you and he was driving, and you were correct. Literally riding shotgun, right? L literally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sir. So t take us from there. Okay. Well, we set up, you know, the usual, you know, I mean, everybody's bantering back and forth before, you know, the meeting starts, you know, hey, listen, hey, how's your mama? No, how's your mama? You know, that, that typical cop stuff, you know, it's like, hey, are you wearing your wife's sweater? You know, <laughs> you know? Did, they, did they sell men's clothes where you got that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, are you still going to that barber school for your haircuts? You know, that type of stuff, you know, just, just, you know, regular old teasing, you know, so, but once the briefing started, everything, you know, quieted down, everything got serious. You know, we, we took notes and they passed out all the uh, all the uh, the composite uh, sketches and so on and uh, it was discussed okay you know you guys are here you guys are here and so on and so on and so on okay and then somebody said okay so what do we know why are we here I said well it's just a hunch okay so we don't have any hard information that they will show up today you know and Gordon had to say no I, I just I feel they're, they're due you know, that kind of puts a different spin on things. And if you say, man, we got a tip, they're going to show up here at 930, guns blazing. It's like, okay, that, that puts a whole different spin on things uh, as opposed to saying, yeah, you know, I had a dream last night and I think they're, they're going to show up today. <laughs> Two totally different, uh, you know, poles of opposition there. You know, one, one is they're showing up, guns blazing, and the other one is, hey, they might show up, you know, so, <laughs> so. But no, it was a good day. I mean, it gets you out of the office. I mean, and the idea was that, hey, listen, we will be in a, in, a, in a position to respond if something does happen. I mean, we didn't know whether it would or wouldn't happen. But based on the odds, something was going to happen. I mean, a bank robbery was going to happen somewhere along the, that corridor or a, an armored truck robbery or a Circle K robbery or something was going to happen. It was Miami after all, you know, so we had a, a very pretty high statistical chance that something was going to happen, you know, so, um, but as far as these two individuals showing up, no, it was like, you know, very low probability. I mean, again, taking Gordon's uh, hunch into, into account, even that was 50-50 you know, or maybe even less than 50, 50, as it turned out to be, it ended up being a hundred percent, you know, so yeah, yeah, a big, big difference, yeah. you know, so, but, um, so we, we go to our, our assigned, uh, locations and, uh, you know, we did what, what officers do, you know, we went there, um, we record ordered the area. Okay. Where's our bank. Okay. Where are the, you know, where are the, the driveways, you know, the, 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 uh, how do cars get in and out of the bank? Where are the bank entrances? Does it have more than one entrance? One entrance, you know, the main entrance, is that the only one that's open? Um, you know, how big is the parking lot? What's around the, the bank? Is it other businesses or is it like a residential, you know, industrial area? You know, so, you know, just typical stuff. You know, okay, you know, where would the best place to be? Where would the best place be for me to sit and surveil without drawing attention, you know, without, you know, basically being secretive, you know, I mean, because you could sit right in front of the bank, you know, two guys sitting in a car with a shotgun like this going, hmm, you know, which way did it go? Which way did it go? <laughs> or you could be really truly be on surveillance, you know, so. But Miami, so, but Miami Dade uh, police have zero idea that y'all are out there. No, no, no. They, they, see, that's another myth. You know, that's another fallacy. You know, they had. They, they were told. I mean, they had 100% knowledge, okay? Okay. Because uh, the FBI and the Metro Robbery Unit worked hand in glove, okay? I mean, we worked together, you know? So we, we as a matter of fact, invited Metro uh, to, to uh, accompany us and assist us. 
but they had a different mission that day. Uh, you know, unlike the, the federal, uh, like the feds, we handle federal violations. Metro handles all robberies. Okay, so they were responsible for, um, they were working another gang of uh, Circle K and 7-Eleven robbers. So they were working on Friday, they were working a four to mid, you know, working that, that shift, doing the same thing we were doing from, from eight to, to four, from, you know, from uh, during daylight, I was ever gonna do it at, at nighttime. So they, uh, they said, thanks for no thanks. You know, we have another uh, surveillance, another mission, and uh, they, they couldn't attend. Additionally, we, uh, the Homestead guys, the guys that, that uh, were out basically outside of the city limits, they had police radios, county police radios in their units. So they notified the district that we were in, which was, I don't, God, I'm just guessing right now. It was maybe district five, district, district six. You know, we notified them and said, Hey, or the, uh, the resident agents notified them saying, Hey, this is um, agent Scarborough. Uh, just be advised that the FBI is doing surveillance in the Southwest district, Southwest district, uh, sixth district along the highway okay and they said okay fine thank you that way they notify their patrol units if they see anything suspicious like two ugly guys with shotguns sitting in a car you know <laughs> it might be the fbi you know so uh typical cop stuff back and forth you know so so uh metro did know metro robbery and the, and the southwest district patrol units knew that we were there you know but you know again a lot of misconceptions a lot of misinformation out there and and every agent sitting in their cars surveilling the parking lot are looking for two white males driving a black Monte Carlo with license plate, blah, 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 right? Correct, right. Yeah. And, and or a white pickup truck, you know. If you saw a white pickup truck driving into a parking lot with two guys in it, you might want to keep an eye on it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so we're, we're sitting there in the car. What happens now? Well... I have to, uh, my recollection is that we were on station, you know, we, we did our surveillance, you know, we drove around the bank, we drove into the parking lot, we drove out of the parking lot, we drove around the bank again, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what is the best, you know, vantage point? You know, where can we sit and be, uh, you know, uh, not calling attention to ourselves, but at the same time, be in a position to respond if something happens, you know. So we finally figured out that we were we we parked in a parking lot in the business south of the bank. There was a, a business right adjacent to the bank, you know, south of it. So we parked in that parking lot as opposed to in the bank parking lot, and we just started to wait. And uh, uh, one of our teammates at, at at our location, Steve Warner, said, "Hey." I'm going to go contact the bank manager and find out when the armored truck deliveries are scheduled for today, because that would be the peak. That would be a key point, you know, when these guys might attack. So, you know, if, if an armored truck's not going to show up till 1030, then, you know, all likelihood is, you know, that nothing will probably happen between now and 1030, you know, or whenever the, the armored truck delivery was going to be made. So he went to the bank and knocked on the on the door the bank was still closed and he flashed his badge on on the on the glass said he wanted to talk to the manager and he was dressed down he wasn't wearing a coat and tie or anything so the manager got spooked and said no we don't want to open the door go away you know so he said okay fine thank you uh, so he got back in his car he reported back to us and said hey you know the bank manager doesn't want to talk to me i'm going to go get some gas i'll let you know what I'm doing. So there was always communication back and forth. You know, you don't do things in secret or independent, you know? So Steve told us, Hey, the bank manager didn't want to talk. I need gas. I'm going to go get some gas. Uh, you know, I'm going to be out of, out of, out of service for a few minutes. So, you know, cool. So we're aware of that in the interim, when Steve goes to get gas, the bank manager called the office and said, Hey, do you have a, um, an employee by the name of Steve Warner and the bank and the office said, yeah, why? So, well, he was in our office, um, you know, a few minutes ago, you know, trying to contact the manager. We just, we were scared because we've been robbed before and we just wanted to verify that he was who we said he was. But, but can you get a hold of him on the radio and tell him that we'll talk to him now? And, uh, okay. So radio station calls for Steve and he's, 
obviously not in service. He's getting gas. So I answered the call and said, hey, what's up? And uh, they, they told me that the bank manager w wants to talk to Steve now. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll pass the message. So um, Steve gets back in the car and says, this is, um, we have we have codes for for um, each each agent or each unit has a has a number as opposed to a name. So uh, this is unit you know twelve whatever the heck his number was. Uh, said hey I'm back in service and I said hey uh, Steve O, um, the bank manager called the office to verify your employment and now that they've verified it they want to talk to you and he said okay. I said why didn't you explain it to her you know <laughs> and he said I explained it once. I said well why don't you explain it to her again you know so he laughed you know. Time and chance. Uh, there's a saying in the Bible, uh, Ecclesiastes 9-11, the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but time and chance happen to them all, happens to all of us. As soon as Steve Warner gets to the bank and he called out, this is a uh, unit whatever, uh, unit 12, I'm 10-7 at the bank. And he turns the car off. No, five seconds later, Ben Grogan called out, attention all units. We're behind a black Monte Carlo, Florida tag, and TJ891. Okay. But before we continue, let me, uh, it's in my book, but it's worth mentioning. The same incident that happened to Steve Warner happened in two other uh, surveillance locations to two other agents. At 136th Street, Terry Nelson told his team, his little units, his little uh, small cadre there hey listen i need to make a library stop you know I'll, I'll be out of out of service for a few minutes so he he was out of service at 148th street bob ross told his team that he, hey listen i need to go make a, a a head call you know so totally innocent uh events in three separate locations you know see warner the bank manager blows him off and then tells him to come back Terry Nelson uh, needs to go to the bathroom at his location, and then Bob Ross, you know, had to go to the bathroom at his location. Unconnected, but connected, <laughs> you know, because three yeah. three agents that were, could have been uh, used. I mean, that could have been could have made a difference, you know, in the outcome uh, of the shooting incident. Were, were were not ten, not in service, and it's no no fault of anybody. I mean, there's there's no no blame anywhere. I mean, if you got to go, you know, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, you can wear adult diapers, but I don't think they were invented back then. You know, so <laughs> anyway, so unbeknownst to me, OK, at the time that Steve Warner went in, hey, I'm, I'm 10 seven at the bank. The uh, two other agents have gone 10 seven at their locations. OK, so when Ben Grogan called attention, our units were behind a black uh, vehicle, two door. Florida tag NTJ A91. We had three agents that were uh, not in service. Okay, and wh what happened to me? It was like, holy shit! Time. It's like what? You know, I I was so amazed that these guys showed up in the black Monte Carlo with the same stolen tag. Um, because that, that car, the tag and the description of the car had been all over the radio for the previous three weeks, you know, all over the, uh, the police nets and, you know, it's like be bolos, be on the lookout, you know, blah, you know, blah, 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 back and forth. And I was just absolutely amazed that they showed up that day in the same car with the same stolen tag. So I was like, holy shit, are these guys crazy? Or are they just freaking so brazen? That is like in your face. I dare you. You know what's that old saying now? That I double dog dare you. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, double dog dare wasn't it wasn't in, in in vogue back in '86, but it was like, yeah, okay, I dare you. And uh, needless to say, I mean, I was shocked. You know, I mean, uh, and we listened to the radio, and somebody called out, "Where are you? What's your what's your 20? And uh, he took uh, Ben. Ben was probably busy, okay, but by the time he announced where he was, he was at 128th Street. It was already two blocks past my location, and I was at the northernmost location for the surveillance. And uh, it's like, holy cow, you know, so by the time um, by the time we got organized, you know, I mean, it didn't take long. I mean, what do you, what, do you, what does it take? Turn the car around, put it in drive, you know, but still it seemed like wheels are spinning, 
<coughs> what's the plan? You know, which way are they going? You know, are they going north or south? That type of thing. So, but uh, John Hanna put the car and and uh, you know got the car out on US one northbound, and uh, we started speeding, trying to catch up to Ben. So by the time we caught up to Ben Grogan, he was already at 120th Street. Okay, so he was another eight blocks north. I mean, because the traffic was moving pretty good. It was heavy uh, late morning rush hour traffic, but it was moving pretty good. But it was there was a lot of cover, a lot of cars. So we caught up to him, and I, I got a glimpse of the black Monte Carlo. I saw I saw Ben Grogan's car. You know, I recognized it. So I said, okay, we're. I told Jake, I said, hey, okay, slow down. You know, we, we don't want to, you know, crawl up their ass. You know, so just kind of hang back. We had lots of cover. So they get to 117th Street, and they took take a right from the main highway. Uh, let me. Let me go back. South Dixie Highway in that area is three lanes northbound and three lanes southbound. So it's pretty it's a pretty big highway. But it's not like like an interstate. It's not wide open. You know, you have you have areas where you have three or four blocks with, with uh, no traffic lights, and then you have other areas where there are traffic lights. So it's it's fast, but it's stop and go. But when they got to 117th, they took a right and they got off the main drag and then they started getting into the side roads. So there was less and less cover. And that's when I said, oh, shoot, you know, we're going to have a problem here. You know, so when they turned, it was the bad guys, Ben Grogan's car, our car, and then Richard Manazzi uh, was behind us. So they keep going eastbound to 81st Avenue. And they turned right again. And at that point, there was nothing. It was just a residential street. You know, it's like, who, Jesus, you know, bad guy, good guy, good guy, good guy car. That's it. You know, it's like, you know, if this isn't obvious, you know, it's yeah. like a big pimple on your nose. It's like, man, you got <laughs> you got to see it. You know, so so um, we try to be as inconspicuous as possible, you know, while being obvious, you know, so um, we went down to 120th Street. And they, in my mind, they knew that we're being followed because instead of driving like normal, like normal people would in a residential street, which would be speeding, you know, so they were driving at about 15 miles an hour. Okay. They were just like real coasting. It's like you could walk almost as fast, you know, so uh, they got up to 120th, the stop sign made a right. Again, a slow, deliberate turn, you know, like real slow, waiting to see out of the three cars that were following them, how many cars followed him and how many cars turned the other way. Of course, no, no, none of the cars turned away, you know, so. And it was becoming obvious that they knew that we were behind them. So uh, my, my concern was that they would go back to U.S. Highway, uh, US, U.S. Highway 1, and knowing their propensity to shoot okay my concern was that they would get up, get on the on the congested road congested highway and just open up the speed and open up with the with the weapons you know i'm thinking oh crap you know there's going to be a running gun battle here you know so that that was my fear and uh, amazingly uh like an answer to a prayer as they're going westbound on 120th street they there was a an intersection uh, to the left, 82nd Avenue. If they had passed that, they would have had to have committed to uh, US-1, but they decided to turn left, to turn southbound on 82nd, which I think was a, was a, a miracle because it's, it's, instead of being on the congested highway, we were in, uh, still on, re on a residential road. So when they turned left at that point, Ben Grogan decided, hey, felony car stop, let's do it, okay? And then he calls out, felony car stop and it turns the siren on and jerry dove puts the uh, bubble gum light you know the little blue spinning light on the dashboard turned the siren on and i saw the reaction of the driver and the passenger uh when, when he turned the siren on if you can see me on on the video they went they actually jumped you know you know in their seats you know it's like whoa you know and i saw them do that you know and i'm thinking well they know they know what's up now <laughs> You know? Yeah, and immediately we went from 10, 50 miles an hour, 10, 12, 50 miles an hour to RPMs. I mean, the gas pedal was being pushed down, and you could you could hear the engines roaring. 
even through the, 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 the closed uh, raised up windows. And uh, the black Monte Carlo start, started speeding up and Ben Grogan peels off and pulls off to the left trying to block him from, from speeding down the highway. And we're, we're closing up behind him. And what followed was a series of uh, car crashes you know, a la TV, a la movie, you know, cars banging back and forth, you know, boom, 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 bang, you know, like that. I mean, I don't even know how many times we crashed, but uh, it was uh, high RPMs crashing. And Ben was trying to, trying to, he, he got in front of them trying to slow them down. But, you know, there was just, I mean, there was just pandemonium crashing, banging back and forth. And uh, at one point in time, I was actually, um, I had a shotgun between my legs, and I was trying to bring the shotgun up to uh, to turn and point at the driver. But I, you know, the shotgun was way too long, you know, for um, for the interior of the car, so um, I couldn't I couldn't do it. So uh, at the same time, though, I'm I'm staring, I'm looking right at the threat point, which is the driver. That's my my perception. The threat point's the driver, and uh, he's got his hands on the steering wheel like this, and he he's like turning around and looking at me like he's glaring at me and I'm glaring at him, you know, in return, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to get the shotgun up. He's, he's maneuvering the car, you know, so I got, uh, simply put, I got tunnel vision, you know, the fight or flight syndrome kicked in because I saw a point of, a point of danger, I saw a threat. So my perception went from wide open to narrow, and I literally narrowed down to his face, you know, the, uh, the driver's face, you know, um, just right there. And uh, I'm sure he probably got tunnel vision too, you know, so, I mean, I, I'm speculating, but I mean, it's, it's a normal fight or flight reaction, you know, people do, you know, to change, you know, so. So at one point in time, at some point in time, our car and their car were actually bumper locked, you know, like this, uh, uh, banged together and they were locked, you know, in, in, you know, by the bumpers or something. Mm -hmm. So we were like moving in tandem left and right. You know, so, uh, and unbeknownst to me, because I was tunnel vision into the driver, the passenger Platt, who, who uh, has been identified as Platt, ha had the assault weapon you know, with on him, or, you know, in his hands, he actually raises it up and aims it in my direction. Okay, but I'm tunnel vision into the driver and I, I didn't see the passenger. So the person who saw the passenger was Richard Manauzi, the car that was behind the, the subjects. And he's looking through the rear window and he sees a silhouette of the passenger raising uh hit an, a long barrel weapon and bringing it in, uh, up to eye level, shoulder level, and aiming it at uh, at me and, and John Hanlon. And I don't know how he would have shot because he would have had to have shot past his, you know, his partner's face. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So regardless, uh, Richard Manazzi saw this and he goes, "Oh shit!" You know, he's going to shoot Ed and John. So. You know, I think uh, there's no doubt Richard saved my life, at least, and maybe even John's life, because when he saw the, the passenger raise the weapon up and, and aim it, uh, he said, oh, so he rammed, he took his FBI car and rammed the stolen car from behind. And when he rammed it from behind, it just pushed it. it we, were, we were locked together and it propelled it forward. Okay, and we stopped being bumper locked. Okay, and then what happened was that the two cars were pushing against each other, and then when they, when they lost contact, they slingshotted across each other like that. So that's how we ended up crashing uh, into a, a cement wall, a concrete wall, and that's how the the uh, stolen Monte Carlo ended up going into a semi-controlled, uncontrolled, spinning U-turn to the left. Okay, so. Um, Richard had prevented a shooting at that point, and he said, well, you know, everybody, everybody's getting spread out. Uh, Ed and, and John are crashed up against the wall. Ben Grogan and Jerry are, uh, are down the road. They're making a U-turn. So the bad guys who had been automatically making a U-turn, you know, I mean, pushing to the left, circled around to the left, and <coughs> excuse me, Richard said, hey, you know what? 
I've already rammed it once. You know, I'm going to ram them again. What do I got to lose? I mean, the car's already damaged. So he said, at least this way I can prevent it from escaping. Because what they ended up doing was making a complete U-turn, 180, and going back in the opposite direction where they had come from. In other words, we were going south, and then all of a sudden they, they decided to go back north on the same street. And Richard said, nah, I don't think that's going to happen. So he rammed them and eventually rammed them enough that he um, ended up pinning them uh, against the, um, a couple of civilian cars in front of a duplex and a tree. So he, he pinned them in pretty good. They were pinned on the right, pinned on the front, and pinned on the left. <coughs> and then uh, uh, Ben and Jerry ended up coming in the car behind them and blocked their rear escape. So they were totally and completely blocked on four sides, you know. So, and that's when uh, that's when uh, all cars came to a, a complete stop, and and, and the the scene was set for, for the gunfight. If you'll yeah. excuse me, let me clear my throat here. And Ed, I was going to ask, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, doesn't Manuzi, because he knows he's fixed to be in a gunfight, he takes his handgun out and loses it in the crash. And I think Hanlon, who was driving the vehicle you were in, did something similar, and both of them lost their primary weapon, right? Correct. You know what, though? And, you know, I have to admit, I mean, I, 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 I had done that myself. I didn't know that. I, um, I mean, I didn't do it at, at that on that day, but I had done it in the, in the past, okay? I When I was sitting on surveillance in Washington, D.C. at night, we worked a lot of night surveillances because uh, I was on a counterterrorism squad. And uh, we were in some not so nice neighborhoods in D.C., you know. So uh, if you're sitting wearing a jacket or wearing body armor and you, you've got your, your gun on your hip, you know, it could be hard to get to. So I, I actually took my weapon out and I slid it underneath my thigh, my right thigh. That way it would be right there. I mean, I, all I had to do is just reach down and grab it as opposed to having to move my jacket, move the body armor and, you know, try to reach it. You know, that, that could take, I don't know, maybe a second or two, whereas reaching the gun underneath my lap could take a quarter of a second, you know, so. But I, I never did it when I was moving. You know, that's the difference, you know. And Richard and John did that when the cars were, were in, in motion. What neither one of them expected to be involved in was a series of, like, our car was involved in anywhere from, I don't know, six, seven, eight, ten, ten crashes like this, back and forth. And that, I mean, that would that will jostle any item loose inside a car. And then Manowski, when he rammed the car from behind, he he sped up. He just stepped on the gas and goes boom, crashes the Monte Carlo from behind. He didn't expect. Uh, to have to do that, you know, and the gun just flew out from, from his control. And um, Richard was totally unarmed. John had a backup. He had an ankle gun. So at least he had that. But Richard thought he his gun had dropped, his car door popped open. And he thought his perception is that the gun flew out onto the street. So when he uh, crashed the bad guys into, into a stop, he looked over to his right, and he, he sees somebody aiming a rifle at him, so he goes, oh, crap. <laughs> so he popped the door open and bails off uh, out the driver's side door as rounds start coming into his uh, uh, passenger compartment area. And he was peppered with shrapnel, but, but he was not hit with a direct round. But, I mean, <laughs> let's be honest, getting peppered with shotgun uh, he was peppered like with a shotgun uh, spray in the back, you know, so. Hmm. But uh, before that happened, though, I was still crashed. Everything happened so so uh, simultaneously, and it seemed it takes longer for me to explain it than, than it, it, it took for, for it to happen. Okay. We crashed up against the wall. I'm literally one second. I'm, I'm looking at the driver, and the next second, second, I'm looking at a cement wall. You know, going, ah, <laughs> you know, I mean, literally, I put my hands up because it happened so quickly and we were going so fast that I, I actually had to put my hands up to, to brace myself against the windshield because, I mean, we had, we were, I mean, fast, you know, I mean, under normal circumstances, without the adrenaline dump and the fight or flight, I probably would have injured myself pretty badly, you know, I mean, 
at least hurt my neck or smash my head up against a, the windshield like a bug, you know, a big, big old bug. <laughs> were, you, were you wearing a seatbelt? No. Nope. No. Okay. Again, I, I didn't want to be encumbered if right. I had to get out of the car. So I, I consciously did not uh, undid my seatbelt. You know, so I, again, I don't know what the right answer is there. Uh, buckle it or not buckle it, you know. So right. I think buckling it, I mean, it, it takes maybe half a second to unbuckle your seatbelt. But then again, that half a second could <laughs> could could mean something, you know. So yeah. you, you never know. You never know. So I'm shaking off the effects of the crash, and it was perfectly still. I mean, the, the silence was stunning. It was so loud, you know. <laughs> it's like, and... I said, okay, I know that I know the crash is behind me. So I knew that they were off to my to my right, you know, so I just I instinctively opened the door, took, uh, uh, spun the shotgun out, not covering my feet, and stepped out of the car and started to run across the street. As soon as I opened the door, the gunfights started because uh, Ben Grogan stopped the car behind them and Gordon McNeil stopped the car to their west side and they both jumped out and they're yelling, FBI, police, put your hands up. And their response was to open fire. You know, so, you know, the gunfight was on. Yeah, that's the one day the old FBI freezer die didn't work, right? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I want to say that uh, at, at that point, Grogan and Dove's vehicle, if I'm not mistaken, is it Grogan or Dove that's credited with getting the first hit on Platt? It was Dove, Jerry Dove. Dove. Yeah, and that, that happened. I'm estimating now it would have to be around 30 to 45 seconds into the gunfight because they were inside their car. They they let opened up, they lit up the neighborhood from inside the compartment of their car, okay? Uh, the driver took a shotgun and fired a shot back at Ben Grogan and uh, the, the round hit the grill, the radiator of his car. And then of course, Ben started re responding with nine millimeter shots at him. And then Platt opened up with the uh, uh, Mini 14 firing to the West. Fire, he fired at uh, Manowski, he fired at McNeil and he fired at me. So he opened up with at least 15 shots from inside the car. At some point in time, he said, hey, you know what? This is a losing proposition here. And he starts to bail out of the car on the passenger side. But since he can't open the door, he had to go through the window. He went through the window, uh, uh, slid across the hood of the, uh, the car that was next to him, the civilian car, slides across the hood of that car and takes a barricade position on the other side of that car. <laughs> now, at, at that point, that's the only time that uh, his right side was exposed to the Jerry Dove's position. And I, I'm telling you, Jerry Dove made a million dollar shot. Okay. Um, he fired his uh, window of, of opportunity was, was three feet from, from left to right. And he, he was shooting at a, at a moving target. Okay. As, as it's crossing his, his line of sight. Okay. So he shot a moving target at 15 yards and made a perfect, center mass hit and that's the round that severed uh platt's brachial artery in his right arm and uh went through the arm didn't hit any bones went through the arm and hit his side wall on the right side of his chest and penetrated in and and hit went through his right lung and according to the autopsy the round stopped about an inch and a half short of the heart okay so um you know, that round right there is what caused uh, all the research that, that, to be conducted into ballistics. Um, you know, what, what the bullets do and what the bullets need to do. Okay, yeah, what yeah. caliber is better, what caliber is, you know, okay, you know, that type of stuff. So, I mean, a huge amount of work has gone into that. Now, mm -hmm. the FBI has set up like standard, nationally recognized testing standards for, for pistol ammo. Okay, it was, the test was started in 1988, I believe, 88, 89. And the, the Bureau was trying to set up a test that could be duplicated by anybody, anybody with any, uh, you know, uh, access to ballistic gelatin, you know, and, and weapons and a range and this and that, you know, they, they, they documented everything, you know, and, and they, um, 
they made notations, you know, and uh, they, they, they even tell you, hey, we, we made ballistic gelatin at X percentage of, uh, of jelly versus, I mean, gelatin versus water and this and that, and we stored it at 40 degrees, you know, I mean, everything is meticulously noted, okay? And then they said, okay, we took the gelatin out, you know, five minutes before testing, so it, it sat outside five minutes as opposed to five hours, because, you know, all of that could have a, 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 an impact on the results. If you've got gelatin that's been sitting out five hours, it could deteriorate. You know, it, it may not be the true, it may not give you the true results. Whereas, you know, this was all documented, you know, and like I said, the, the Bureau wanted to make sure that this test could be reproduced by any other organization and that the results should be identical or almost as close to identical as possible. And I think that's proven to be the, the fact over the last uh, 30, 30 years, you know. Absolutely. Plus, you know, the, uh, the tests were conducted. They were shooting at bare gelatin. Then they were shooting at gelatin covered with a with a cloth simulating a dress shirt. And then I think there was one test that was uh, uh, gelatin simulating cloth and a leather jacket, like somebody would wear, like a you know, like a leather <laughs> leather jacket, you know. And then other uh, other tests were uh, cloth shooting through uh, a simulated car windshield. Okay, and then again, cloth and gelatin simulating uh, shooting through a, a car door. Okay, and plywood and and drywall and so on. So everything was was noted and 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 explained and everything else so that this test could be duplicated. You know, so and I tell you what, though that was um, that was probably one of the best things that came came from this incident. You know, was the uh, the ability to test ballistics. You know, of all kinds of uh, you know, all kinds of calibers and all kinds of conditions, you know. And um, they also had the uh, wound seminar uh, in 1988. They brought in uh, medical examiners from around the country, uh, military folks, uh, snipers, <coughs> excuse me, military snipers and stuff. And they had a symposium say, okay, what, how do you stop a human target? I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of, you know, pretty in your face. How do you put down a human target, you know? But that's what we're in the business of doing, you know? How do you stop a human target? And of course the answer was always, hey, listen, a rifle round is always gonna be the choice, okay? Whether it's a headshot or a shot to the chest, you know? A two, two, three round or a 30 caliber round to the, to the head or chest is gonna ruin your day, you know? So everybody kind of knew that from, from you know, past, uh, events, you know, World War One, Two, Korea, and so on and so forth, and all the military people, everyone agreed. But the key was what type of handgun round is the best choice for law enforcement. There is no, there is no such thing as a one shot, one kill with uh, pistol ammunition, okay? So they had to come up with the best option, um, okay, you, you do we issue 22s to everybody or do we issue 30, 32s or 38s or nine millimeters or do we issue 44 magnums? Of course, everything has advantages and disadvantages. You know? So what they ended up, what the wound ballistic seminar came up with, with the same thing with rifles, bigger is better. Okay, but uh, not too many people in this world or in, at least in the United States, can shoot a 44 Magnum consistently with any accuracy. Because I don't care who you are, that thing's going to kick your butt, man. <laughs> you know? I, I tried to shoot 50 rounds of a 44 Magnum uh, on a qualification course. I think I got to like 30 rounds, and I I, I, I called King's X. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. I mean, yeah. that, that 44 kicked my ass. You know, so. And, you know, so obviously, you know, you have to have, you know, you have to balance, you know, reasonableness with, with uh, you know, the equipment, you know, what, what, what are you looking at? So what they came up with, you know, they, they kind of settled on the, on the nine, the 38, the nine, they, they uh, got a 10 millimeter from someplace to test it and then the 45 caliber. Okay, so they went back and forth and they said that the nine and the 38 were too small, you know, not powerful enough or didn't penetrate deeply enough. So they, they kind of circled back to the uh, the 10 millimeter and the 45. So 
that's when the FBI 10 millimeter project came 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 to fruition. You know, um, but the problem was that uh, even even the 10 millimeter, if you look at a 10 millimeter, it's like a magnum. It really is like a magnum, right? And and, and someone equated it to, to me one time as a 41 magnum. Okay, as opposed to a 44 magnum. So I said, well, you know, that that 10 millimeters got some good zip to it. But at the same time, uh, unbeknownst to the FBI, when we were working on the 10 millimeter project, Smith and Wesson was also at at the very end stages of unveiling their their 40 caliber uh, project. That's what they call it. The Smith and at, at at one time it was called the Smith and Wesson 40. Okay, now we're, now everybody just calls it the 40. You know, so but in the beginning it was called the Smith and Wesson 40. And uh, after after all things were were reviewed the the bureau said you know what the 40 the 10 millimeter is is too hot of a load too much of a magnum load so they settled on the 40 caliber and for what three decades i think it was the 40 caliber was was the round to go to you know as far as police rounds would go would, would go and again with the ballistics testing gel you know that, that it proved you know that that the, the minimum parameters for penetration were, were always consistent with the 10 with the nine the 40 caliber round you know? so that's that's what came out of this uh, incident you know the the, the the shot that jerry dove made on Platt. because mm -hmm. Platt, and the, there's also the psychological side of survival you know uh, there was a ballistic side, the, the marksmanship side, and then and then the, the question kept asked with, uh, that kept being asked was, why did Platt not stop when he was shot in the way Jerry shot him? He, it ripped his brachial artery; it just ripped it, shredded it apart, shredded his uh, right lung, but he did not stop fighting. Okay, that goes to mindset and the will to survive. Okay, and it also is coupled with, there, there were a couple of 101st uh, Army Rangers. Okay, mindset, training, 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 training. Okay, they, they were not your average, you know, gang banger, you know, talk shit, you know, all day long, you know, not do nothing. So, okay, these guys were, you know, they didn't talk shit, they, they, but they did, their, they, they did their deeds talk for them, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, they let their deeds talk for them, you know, so. Uh, so yeah, on, that, on that day, Dove, when he scores that fatal hit that you just talked about, Ed, he's he's firing, if I remember correctly, 115 grain silver tip, nine millimeter. And I'd read somewhere that besides the shot that you've already indicated, he wounded him in the thigh and potentially the foot as well right. while he was exiting that Monte Carlo. So that is, that is correct. He he hit, but the, the the main hit was to the to the main to the yeah. center of mass. Okay, and as he kept moving. From from Jerry's left to right, Jerry continued to, to score hits. He scored a hit center mass on on the uh, on the leg, which is the buttocks area. And then as he moved, as he continued to move to the right, he hit us. He hit the uh, I think it was his left foot, a through and through hit to the left foot. You know, so um, so he got three hits on him. I mean, you know, and you know, again he's moving left to right. Okay, and Jerry man, he 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 put the he put the mark right on him. And and Grogan is with him, but I believe they're in the same vehicle together, if I remember correctly. But Grogan lost his glasses and, and had trouble with vision. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct, yeah. I tell you what, I, when I was young and, and good looking, you know, I, I didn't wear these. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now, I feel you. Now, now I'm, I'm just an old man, you know. I'm just an old man with a gun now, you know. So, <laughs> but I, I have you. to wear my spectacles, you know. So, but you know what, Jerry? I mean, uh, Ben. Ben had to wear glasses. I mean, you know. But you know, uh, Ben was the, uh, my, from my understanding, uh, he was the best shot on the squad. He was a, one of the best shots on the SWAT team. Okay, but without his glasses, I mean, it was like, man, it's kind of like me now. I'm, I'm almost seventy, and uh, you know, I'm just like, whew, man. I mean. I can still see, you know, I can see a barn, but I may not be able to see that barn door, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, your eyesight, you know, starts to fail, but, and that's what happened to it, it, Simon Chance. It, who would have thunk, who would have thought it, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, again, no, no one expects to lose their glasses. No one expects to lose their gun from out, uh, out underneath their, their, their thigh, you know, but 
time and chance happens, you know. I mean, and I tell, I, when, I, when I've instructed uh, law enforcement classes, I tell them, I said, hey, you know what? I, I, I took my gun out of my holster and put it underneath my thigh. But I'll tell you what, after April 11th, I, I never did it again. Never, ever, ever. There's only two places where your gun should be. It should be secure in your holster or it should be in your hand. Okay, one of the two. And nowhere else. Okay, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it needs to be secure, you know. Now, now, at this point, everybody's bailing out of the vehicle, I would imagine. You know, uh, uh, McNeil gets out of his vehicle. He's running across with a shotgun, maybe? No, no, and, no. He, he, McNeil exited his vehicle with his 38. Okay. His, uh, 357 Magnum, I'm sorry, but he had 38 loads in it. He didn't go very far. He was right next uh, to Manazi's car. He, he probably moved about eight feet and took took cover behind uh, uh, Manazi's engine block. But you're coming to assist him, am I correct with that? When you are armed with a shotgun, right? Yeah, I, I was armed with a shotgun. I had to okay. I had to move uh, 50 yards from my oh, wow. position to, to his position in a, in a serpentine way. You know, my initial thought was to get directly across to the nearest point of cover. But as I'm crossing the street, I'm, I'm, I'm scanning left and right. And I'm, I'm thinking, OK, the weak spot in this line is on the left side. So I veered from the nearest point of cover off to the left and, and went up, went over to reinforce Gordon. Okay. And, and Gordon, um, I've heard something about like, as you're coming near him, you don't want to muzzle him and maybe you go muzzle up or something like that. Ed, or did I hear That's that? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. You know, again, training, 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 you know, on the range, you know, you can't overemphasize safety. Even in, in a, in a, in a hot situation when bullets are already flying, I mean, bullets are whizzing by me as I'm running into reinforce Gordon, but I'm still cognizant of safety because I was running across the street. I was running at port arms. Okay. And kind of, kind of like a elder Fudd port arms because it was the muzzle was more aimed uh, at, at forward, not at direct military port arms, more like this. And when I came around the back of the car and I, my muzzle was aimed at McNeil's back, I said, Oh shit. You know, I said, man, I, I got to think safety. And I had to, because I, I had my finger in the trigger guard and the safety was off. I mean, I was ready to go. Okay, so I'm glad I thought and think of safety. And I raised when I raised the muzzle of, of the weapon up, my arm, my forearm came across my my body, and that's when I got shot. Actually, it was across my left arm. Right. See, see how? Oh yeah. The round hit me right about here. Oh gosh. So I mean, that's again, that's a one in a million shot. Okay, I couldn't. I could, you couldn't reproduce that again. <laughs> In a million times, you know, so. Are you right or left-handed in that moment? I'm, I'm right-handed. Yeah, it hit me in the left arm. Okay, thank God. And um, was McNeil shot before you were shot, Ed, or right after no, you were shot? I was shot first. Okay. And I went down, and I actually saw McNeil get wounded. And uh, it was an amazing hit. He was shot with a two to three round right between right between uh, the the trigger finger and the middle finger right there oh wow as, as he was aiming the gun at the uh, subjects you know so a uh, two to three round goes right between these two fingers and i saw that and i saw him react and his 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 hand literally flew up and over his head and I'm thinking to myself, what the hell is he doing? You know, I'm thinking, you know, it didn't dawn on me that he had taken a, a rifle hit. Okay. And, and until he brought the weapon back down and he fired two additional shots, his last two shots. And it wasn't until after he fired those two shots that, that it kind of, the light bulb lit up in my, my brain. I'm thinking, oh my God, he was shot. Okay. How many movies have you, have, have you and your audience uh, seen, you know, the old Westerns, you know, the old especially the 50s westerns you know where you know the good guy confronts the bad guy but the good guy's too good he won't kill the bad guy he'll shoot the gun out of his hand you know ping, you know yeah. oh my God, you know Bart, black heart give it up you know it's like i tell you what gordon man he took a rifle hit right right through the thing through the fingers and he did not let go of that gun he had a death grip on that gun he it went up and it came back down and fire two more shots. Amazing thing. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> and then he takes a round, I think, to somewhere to the spine, if I'm not 
Because right. Remember- that was that was a few minutes later. Uh, okay. He went when he ran out of ammo. He retreated back behind his car to reload. <laughs> and if you read uh, the chapter in my book, uh, the way he described it to me, and I, I wrote it down the way I remember it. He said he he was using his left hand because his right hand was shattered. He was using his left hand to reload, but he got uh, his he had to kind of cradle the gun in his right. And when he closed the cylinder, after he loaded, he closed the cylinder on the revolver. He said he had so so much flesh and bone fragments caught in the cylinder. <laughs> I still think about this, you know, Gordon, Gordon passed away in 2001, you know, unfortunately. Uh, but I still remember this. He said when he closed the cylinder on the on the on the, the revolver, he said it, it looked like his gun was bleeding. There was so much flesh and bone fragments caught in in the cylinder that when he closed it, he had to like force it shut, and it, it looked like it was bleeding you know, on its own. He goes, "Well, that gun's not going to work." So he said he dropped the gun and he and he moves uh, to the rear of his car to retrieve the shotgun back there, and that's when he was shot the second time. Through, through the neck, you know, I mean, next to the neck, uh, and it, it, it went parallel to his spinal cord, and it, it, it stunned him, you know, it, it kind of paralyzed him for a few days. That's incredible, yeah, That and so now he's on the ground. Uh, at this point, does Arantia and Reisner show up on the scene, or are y'all still on your own? No, no, they they, they, they arrived almost, uh, almost simultaneously. Uh, they arrived like maybe two or three seconds after the shooting start, okay. started. They, they, I mean, they weren't there for the first shot, but as they're parking, uh, they were there for like the fourth or fifth shot, you know. So it was so close; it's almost like they were there when it started, you know. So, but yeah, by, is- by, by this point, you've been shot in the. Okay, so I'm just McNeil's laying on the ground. You've been shot grievously shot. I mean, it almost took your arm off, if I remember correctly. I mean, it, yep. you're you're in bad shape. Yep. Yep. And, and then now, Manazi, Manazi was peppered in the back with, you know, like a, a whole bunch of shrapnel. So he 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 went out and sought cover uh, behind a cement wall across the street. <clears throat> yeah, and then we have, um, see, Hanlon is out of the car. Uh, Grogan and Dove are fighting. Uh, and I think at some point, Dove's 9 millimeter is shot by Platts 223. Is that correct? Yeah, but that was towards the middle or towards the end of the gunfight. Okay. You know, okay. I saw one of your I saw one of your comments, uh, one of your uh, listeners commenting. You know, uh, was that because the, the people are visualizing the gun? And that's a, that's a good point. Uh, it, it's been learned that in a lot of police shootings or a lot of shootings in general, people have a tendency to fo- focus on the threat. Okay, they they tunnel they tunnel towards the threat. If I have a gun, uh, oops, let me see where. If I have a gun pointing at you or I'm drawing a, a gun, you won't focus on my face. You'll focus on my weapon, okay? And wherever your your point of vision goes, that's usually where your round goes because you'll generally shoot in, in at the thing you're looking at. It's called point shooting, okay? I was shot in the gun hand. McNeil was shot in the gun hand. Uh, Maddox was shot in the gun hand. Platt, if you can stretch it a little bit, was shot in the gun hand. John Hanlon was shot in the gun hand. Okay, so there at least four or five of us were shot in the gun hand, which kind of validates, you know, wherever you see the threat, where you look at the threat and you fire where you're where you're looking at. It's, it's called point shooting. Yeah, and Cub, <laughs> although not maybe not shot in the gun hand, his gun was shot and completely out of his hand. Yeah, yeah, his gun, and, you know. But see, that that's another case, you know, where his, the gun was shot, you know, out of out of uh, Dub's hand, really, literally. Yeah, and so, I tell you, if a lot like uh, Alan Kelly, who asked that question, has like thirty five years. He's a retired Virginia State trooper, mm-hmm. and um, I, I'm sure Alan experienced it. I know I did uh, shooting simunitions, whether in the Marine Corps or in uh, law enforcement. Yeah. And yeah. I would be picking those simunition rounds out of my hands if I didn't yeah. wear leather gloves, because exactly everybody's exactly. getting shot in the hand. Yeah, yep. At least half of us were shot in the gun hand, you know, or you know, in my case, I had the shotgun up here. You know, I, they were shooting, you know, he saw the, the shotgun. He probably saw that big, long boomstick, you know, and he aimed he aimed right at it and, and ended up hitting me in the uh, forearm. 
And Dr. T.C. Fuller's on, he's a retired FBI agent. He says, focus on the threat. How many victim bank tellers have you interviewed who could tell you all about the big gun shoved at them with no clue as the suspect's description? <laughs> oh, my God, I've seen that. You know, what did he look like? Well, he had a real long nose and he had a big hole like this, you know. It yeah. was black, you know. It's like, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your service. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll be leaving now. <laughs> Okay, so, sir, um, let's see. McNeil is just been wounded. He's gone down. Um, I think, uh, was it Platt wounded and then he transitioned to a, another firearm? Or where are we at now? Right. Ed? You know, I, as I said, he fired, I think there was about 15 or 16 shell casings inside the Monte Carlo. And then he, he when, when he escaped after Jerry Dove shot him, he escaped to the other side of the uh, civilian car. And uh, the. Um, at, at that position, he um, he's continued to fire, and he fired all thirty rounds in his magazine, thirty round magazine. So, you know, there, there's a, a training course. You know, you you, you every time you uh, if you have a long weapon, you know, you, you run out of ammo, you you can try to change the magazine, or you can transition to your sidearm and kind of like cover your your reload. You you may, maybe fire a few rounds, holster, and then take the time to reload, and that's what happened. Um, he had a revolver with him and it was dropped on the ground. He fired three shots, uh, from, from the revolver, but, and he reloaded he, because the empty magazine was next to the revolver reloaded with a, with a second 30 round magazine. And he, and he kept, kept going after that. But at that position, he was wounded twice, two more times. One was, uh, a through and through hit from, uh, uh, uh Gilbert Arantia. And the other uh, hit was from a nine millimeter round from uh, Ron Reisner. Okay, we recovered the round from Ron Reisner and it was ballistically proven to be a nine millimeter. The through and through round just went through, you know, we attribute that hit to, um, to Gil Gilarantia. <clears throat> and by the way, I gotta say, those hits at a, a silhouette, a side view of a silhouette from a distance of 40 yards, guys. Wow. wow. Standing side silhouette in the shade, hidden, you know, basically obscured. You're shooting from sunlight into a shady spot. And uh, both agents, you know, they fired several rounds, okay? But they got two real impressive hits on, on the subject. And I'm gonna tell you, you know, a few years ago, Mike Seekland and I went and trained a group of FBI agents. Uh, I won't say where, but I tell you what, to this day, the, the best shots we've ever trained. I mean, they were, and, and, and uh, most of them were SWAT guys or firearms instructors, but still the caliber of the, the firearms training in the FBI is, is incredible. I will attest to that. Well, you know what though? I agree with you, but you know what though? I, I you got to call a spade a spade. You know, you got to call a horse a horse. Uh, the federal agencies have the advantage. Okay, because budget, budget, budget. Right. You know, uh, most other police agencies, uh, uh, <laughs> most other police agencies have have budget restrictions. Uh, some of them only qualify once a year. Some of them qualify twice a year. In the bureau, we are required, mandated, to qualify four times a year. Okay, mm -hmm. and you are encouraged. They, in the old days, they actually used to give you ammunition. <clears throat> so that you could go practice on your own at least once a month. Okay, so I mean, I took it. I took advantage of that. I mean, if somebody wants to give me free ammo, shoot, I'll pay for a range. I'll I'll, I'll blow up all the ammo you can give me. You know, so I, I used to shoot at least once a month. You know, so so Hanlon, Dove, and uh, Grogan are behind the I believe the white Buick. Yep. And at this point, Platt is maneuvering around. I think Grogan and Dove are maybe trying to f fix his nine mil and get it back in the fight. And I think Hanlon is reloaded, but he's been wounded. Platt's Correct. coming around the vehicle. And uh, if you could tell us what happened next. Correct. You know, uh, you know, let, let me st take a step back, you know, and, and I, I uh, recently had a lecture um, and I brought it, brought it to the attention of the, uh, of the audience, you know, cause I had a mixed uh, group of military and, and, and retired police officers. You know, th there's a difference between a military uh, uh, doctrine or philosophy and a law enforcement doctrine philosophy. In law enforcement, we're, we're taught, hey, listen, you show up on scene, you know, you, you, you do what you gotta do. And if you take fire, if you take incoming fire or, or see a threat, 
you know, I ask, I ask uh, officers, what do you do? What are you taught to do? Well, you, you're taught to take cover and, uh, you know, return fire if, if feasible and, co and call for backup. Okay, cover, return fire, feasible, call for backup. What is the military doctrine? Okay, <laughs> if you're on patrol. Locate, and, close with, and destroy the enemy. Exactly. Yeah. Totally opposite doctrine. You know, through fire and maneuver, That's right. close with the enemy and eliminate him, destroy him, you know, kill him, you know, burn him, frag him, whatever, whatever the term you want to use. But the thing is through fire and maneuver, That's right. close with the enemy. We're taught to hunker down, take cover, call for backup. Two diametrically opposed philosophies. And this is a classic example of, of those two philosophies coming, coming in, in, in direct, uh, you know, head-to-head -head, uh, confrontation. The, the agents hunkered down behind cover. Platt, who was a 101st uh, Ranger, maneuvered. He maneuvered. He, he went around the car. He laid down suppression fire on Ben Grogan, Jerry Dove, and John Hanlon, laid down suppression fire, and moved in to get closer. And he shot, uh, he shot John Hanlon once. He, he uh, maneuvered, closed in, and shot Han John Hanlon two additional times in the thighs. He had wounded Jerry Dove before. And we don't know exactly, the, exactly where or how the sequence happened, but Jerry had, had uh, received a, through a real serious hit uh, through his left shoulder, and it was a, a, a wound going down because he was ducked down. He was, you know, in a, in a cover position, I guess, and the round went down his collarbone, straight down his uh, left lung, down his pancreas, and uh, the round uh, embedded in his left uh, hip shattered the hip. I asked a doctor about that hit, and the doctor told me, he said, hey, man, that round covered so much area in Jerry's body. He said, man, that was a devastating hit and probably a non-survivable hit for Jerry. But, I mean, we'll never know because Platt came around and shot him in the head later. So, I mean, that's, that was really non-survivable. But, but the, the hit to the, to the torso, to the, the shoulder, lung, and, and intestines and pancreas, you know, that's probably would have been a non-survivable. So he, he wounded him there. And even uh, Ben Grogan had had a, had a previous hit. He was shot through the left thigh, I believe. So all three agents had been wounded by Platt. Okay. And once he wounded them, he continued to lay down suppression fire and closed with the threat and continued to, fi to fire on him and, and eventually killing two of the three agents back there. Yeah, and that's, I mean, Hanlon is just lucky to have survived. I mean, at that very close lucky. Quarters, yeah, it's very just lucky, amazing. Yeah. So um, after he kills those agents, does he try to get in that vehicle and flee at that point? Yes, he does. But uh, somewhere in between, and we, again, we don't know the sequence of events. You know, all we know is that they, they happened. When he, when, he, he, when he went around the back of Ben Grogan's car, he shot, he shot down Hanlon twice. He killed Ben Grogan. He comes around to the driver's side where Jerry Dove ended up and shoots Jerry twice in the head and, and definitely kills him there. Okay, but at some point in time, and no, we have no witnesses because I just saw a pair of legs running forward by the time I managed to maneuver to, to, get, um, to get a good look at, at, the, at the, the area where I saw the legs. Platt and Maddox were already inside Ben Grogan's car. So at some point in time, Platt ran forward, and we don't know whether Maddox maneuvered himself into the car or whether Platt went to retrieve his partner. Okay, but somehow they both ended up in the FBI car. Platt was the driver and Maddox ended up being the passenger. Now they had the presence of mind to bring their equipment. They brought, they had a, an equipment bag with them and uh, they had additional, uh, M, uh, five additional 30 round magazines. They had their, their, their uh, hats and, and uh, ski masks and stuff like that. So that ended up in the FBI car. And of course, they were trying to escape at that point. Now, the FBI car was that the white Buick that you can yes. see online? Okay. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. to the viewer watching today or in weeks to come, please go and and look at the crime scene photo where you see the back of that white Buick, and you will see uh, Platt's blood just pumping out from Dove's hit on the back of that car. It is, 
absolutely amazing that he was uh, still in the fight, still uh, killing agents, and yet had a non-survivable wound. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, that, that's that's the amazing part, you know. And and I just went to a conference uh, last week, and and there was a medic ta talking in there uh, to to the group. You know, uh, uh, he was a former uh, Marine Corps medic. And now he's just a civilian medic for a, a, a range. You know, he, the range has uh, medical personnel on standby and stuff. And he said, he, you know, he called it what, what uh, Dr. French Anderson called it, a class four hemorrhage. When you lose 40% or more of your blood, you are toast. You are, at, you are on death's door, okay? And at some point in time, okay, Platt, when he was shot, okay, Platt, if, if he had given up, when Jerry shot him, it is conceivable, possible that he could have survived. If he said, hey, okay, you got me, King's X, I give up, please get me some medical attention. But he kept going and going and going and going to a point, he reached the tipping point where he tips over to a non-survivable point, okay? And that point was reached when he lost 40% of his blood or more. They estimate he had lost 50% of the blood volume in his system. Wow. They found uh, one in, a, one in uh, I think, a quarter, uh, a quart and a quarter in his lung. And he had another, you know, the balance of uh, two quarts uh, in his, uh, inside his uh, chest uh, tissue. And then you see all the, in the crime scene photo, all that arterial bleeding on the back of the car and on the on the on the uh, civilian car when he first got out that's got to be at least three quarts of blood easy okay in, in combination so i mean i mean you lose i think by volume i think most of adult males especially larger ones have six quarts of blood in their system you know six five and a half to six and a half quarts of blood and you lose three of them you <laughs> you i mean you you're you're toast yeah, you're going yeah, in your yeah, shop. Yeah. So yeah. Th they get inside the vehicle, the the white agent's vehicle. Uh, you see, you see this going on at some point, Ed. Ed, tell us what happens at this point. Well, you know, I I, I managed to get into a position where I I, I could see because when I was shot and, uh, behind Gordon McNeil's position, I couldn't see anything. I was I was basically like in a canyon. I had a car in front of me and a car to my. Uh, to my right and then a tree on, on my left, you know, so I was basically in a, in a little box canyon there and I, I could hear the gunshots, but I, I couldn't see anything. So I, I, I said, well, from, from my, my, my vision here is north, okay? I, I, I heard the, the gunfire moving from my north uh, slightly to the east, more to the east, more, more to the east, to a point where it was all the way to the east. So I said, well, everything's going on on that side. So I, I started crawling on my back uh, to get around the cars so that I basically maneuvered slowly uh, on my on my back around the cars to see what the hell was going on on the other side of the car. You know, so and when I finally got in a position where I, I cleared the car to see, I saw that's when I saw Platt Maddox um, inside the agent's car, uh, Ben Grogan's car, trying to escape. And. I immediately I assessed the situation. I said, okay, if these guys move the car, they have to, the only way they can escape is to back it up. And if they back the car up, they're going to run absolutely positively over two agents and maybe a third agent. So I said, no breaking way in hell are they going to move that car? You know, so I, I said, well, you know, I've got this heavy weapon. I've got the shotgun. And I bet you, you know, that if I start putting rounds into the, uh, compartment of that car, you know, it'll kind of distract them, <laughs> as as you as you would imagine it would, you know. So, oh, yeah. so, so uh, I said, okay, I came up with a plan. I'm thinking, thinking, okay, how am I going to employ the shotgun? You know, I I could shoot it. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I did shoot it one handed from underneath the car, but I don't remember this. I don't remember doing it. The crime scene photos show that I did it, but I don't recall. I don't have any independent recollection of having shot it one handed, you know, but uh, the four out of the five rounds I remember. Okay. And I'm thinking, okay, how, how am I going to employ this weapon? So I, I was looking around, scanning around and I put, I, I saw the lip of the bumper and I'm thinking, Hey, you know what? If I put the fore end of the shotgun on this bumper, I can use it to steady the shotgun. While I, while I, my right hand is back at the trigger guard, I can, you know, maneuver the gun, you know, adjust the sights, 
and you know sight picture sight alignment and uh, that's how i fired the the four rounds you know I, I, I used the lip and when the gun recoiled i i just let the recoil kind of push me back and i i would i would go back into a sitting position with my back uh, against uh, Gordon McNeil's car, and I let the shotgun slide through my my hand, and the butt of the shotgun hit the ground, and I pinched it with my thighs to, to hit, hold it steady. Then I racked the action with my good good hand, and then I went back down to the trigger guard, came back up again, and, and uh, placed the fore end of the shotgun on the on the bumper on the lip of the bumper, and I fired four shots into the uh, into the Ben Grogan's car, you know, and that stopped him from uh, from trying to maneuver the car. You know, so, um, but you know what the amazing part of that is? I had uh, five shotgun rounds and they were all uh, loaded with 12 buck, 12 pellet uh, magnum ammo. I think the normal load for out, out in the real world is nine pellet. Okay, uh -huh. but the Bureau had 12 pellet magnums. Okay, I don't know. I think, I don't think there were three inch magnums. I think there were two and three quarters, but it was 12 pellet uh, ammo. And what's 12 times 5 is 60, 60 pellets or about. Now, would you believe not one single pellet hit hit the subjects? What? As 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 many rounds as I put in there, as many as those pellets you know, hit hit the uh, the side windshield, the car, the, the front windshield, not one single pellet hit a subject. But it got them to duck their head. Okay, it stopped them from moving. <laughs> You know, so uh, in in that respect, I accomplished my task in, in preventing them from backing the car up. So the rest of it had to be, you know, up close and dirty, you know, with a revolver. You know, so and, and I loved every second of it too. <laughs> I bet. I, one question, Ed. I, I'd read somewhere that one of the eyewitnesses says they saw Platt come out and shoot at you at close range. Was that any truth to that? You know, I have to go with the witness. Um, here, here's, here's the reality. The only time I took my attention off the threat was when I, I fired my fifth shotgun round and I knew I was empty. So I laid the shotgun down next to me. Okay. I'm thinking, well, that, that gun's toast. You know, I, I can't reload. And number one, and number two, I don't have any more shotgun ammo because I left it in the car. <clears throat> so the only time I took my eye off the threat <clears throat> was when I laid the shotgun down and then I looked over to my right at a 45 degree angle. And that's when I, uh, uh, I was calling out to the agent Gilaranti and Ron Reiser. And I took my right hand up and I went, come on over. It's okay. Come on over. And, uh, it was, it, it was, it had to be during that time frame when I, I had to, I totally forgot about the threat and I'm looking at the ages come on over and they're yelling at me, stay down, stay down. And I said, it's okay, come on over. And they said, stay down, stay down. And I'm thinking, uh, what we have here is a failure to communicate. You know? right. So and I'm thinking, why are they telling me to stay down? Don't they know the gunfight's over? You know, and then it, it dawned on me, I'm thinking, holy shit. You know, they don't know the gunfight's over. And, I, and then I scanned farther to, to, to the right, north, and I saw about, I don't know, 15, 20 ambulances and fire engines. And then I scanned to my left, south, and I, I saw another 10 or 15 ambulances and fire engines down there. And cops, you know, they, they had set up a perimeter. And I'm thinking, holy shit, all this helps here. And they don't know the gunfight's over. I said, we are going to die. Because I, I, at that point, I was like passing out. I mean, I, I was like, uh, my my... My consciousness, you know, was I was like, if you look at me, like I, I was like, like sometimes when you drive home after the bar, you know, <laughs> no, that's not true. Don't do that. That's no, bad, 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 you know. But if you know what I mean, you know, yes. case, you know. So I was, I was passing out, Oof. and uh, I'm thinking, shit, you know. And I, somewhere in that time frame, I had a conversation with God. You know, the 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 five stages of a, a survivor survival or death. You know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, you know. Mm -hmm. I went through four of those stages. I didn't go through the depression because it was too short. I mean, I, I went through all those emotions like in, in a second or two. And believe me, I had a conversation with God, okay? And the conversation was like, you know, God said, nah, I'm not going to take that wager, you know. <laughs> you know, you're, you're toast, pal. You know, And 
I'm, I'm making light of it, but it's not, it wasn't. It was a serious conversation. And you know what? I came to the conclusion saying, oh, shit, I am going to die. And, you know, and, and you know what? That's a that's a pretty <laughs> that's a pretty serious conversation you have, you know, with yourself and God. And when I when I admitted and accepted the fact that I was going to die, I, I um, it was liberating. Uh, I, I was no longer angry. I was no longer fearful. Uh, it was nothing. I was I was almost tranquil. It was tr a tranquility. I mean, I, I tell people, I said, man, I wish I could bottle this, and you know, it would outsell cocaine in a day. You know, I'm saying it was the, the the feeling of tranquility was just so awesome. Okay, and it was only at that point in time that I took my t my attention off the threat that the witness across the street, uh, uh, Sidney Martin, saw Platt get out of the driver's side door stagger to within 10 or 12 feet of my position. He, he didn't expose himself to the agents across the street to Gilarante or Ron Reisner because they never saw him. Okay, he stayed behind behind cover and I, I'm facing west and he is to the behind me to the east and I never saw him. I never heard the shots because my my they I got, I received a, a grazing head wound to to the, to the left temple area and it just rung my bell. All all I could hear was like a ringing in my ears, and of course the, the auditory exclusion and tunnel vision. So Sidney Martin saw him. Gordon McNeil told me that he heard the gunshots. You know that, that someone had was firing three or four shots you know, in his direction or my direction. He said he didn't know who, who the target was, but he said he heard the shots and he, you know, he was paralyzed in the street. And he said he looked at the street, at the macadam, you know, the tar on the street. <clears throat> and he said he actually saw the rounds hitting and and and, and cutting divots into the street and, and it was exploding up in, 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 in asphalt and stuff. So he heard the shots, McNeil heard the shots, Sidney Martin saw and heard the shots and I didn't hear anything. You know, I didn't see anything, and neither did uh, Gil Arantia or Ron Reisner, you know, but I have no reason to doubt Sidney Martin, you know, but to me, it, it, honestly, it's a non-issue. I mean, because, you know, he, he, he missed me. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> and at that point, is that when you, you went through the four of the five stages of grief, Platt gets back in the vehicle, and you say, not at today. That, at that point in time, you know, I'm thinking, holy shit, you know, we're going to die. You know, we, I, you know, it's like tranquility. But at the same time, there was still a spark of survival left. So I'm still thinking, I, I don't, you know, it's like, do not go gentle into that good night. That's right. You know, I still wanted to live. You know, there's no doubt about it. You know, and I'm thinking, you know what? You know, in case you don't know this or your audience doesn't know this, I am a Christian man. You know, I mean, I, I believe in the, in the, you know, the good and evil and, you know, all, all the good deeds, you know, the golden rules. So I said, you know what? If I'm going to die, I'm going to take those two sons of bitches with me. You know, that, that's a nice Christian thought there. <laughs> you know? So I said, and that's exactly what I said. Okay. And I said, okay, you know, I want to live. I want to survive. And the only way that the, all the perimeter is going to know it's a safe zone to come in to help is for me to stand up. You know, the, that's the only way anyone's going to come in because everybody thinks nobody knows what's going on. Everybody thinks it's still going on. Okay, so I stood up, I drew my revolver, and then I came out from behind the uh, uh, McNeil's car, and um, I started moving in. You know, some people say it was a charge, other people say it was a stagger. It was a stagger. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I am, I'm, I'm like on fumes. I mean, I am passing out. I'm shaking my head violently, trying to stay awake. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, with all that said, I still had training and technique in, in mind. Okay, I took, I mean, I didn't just jump up and, and, and leave cover. I actually stood up and I, I peeked around and I'm assessing and I'm looking for the threat. Okay, does someone have a shotgun or a, a rifle aimed at me? Okay, because, you know, if they get if they get a good good beat on me, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely toast. I mean, that's center mass hit, you know, so. So, I mean, I, I was cautious. I wasn't uh, reckless, you know, and then I stepped out from behind cover and I set, you know, I set a good shooting stance. Uh, what we call the police shooting stance, you know, the old one-handed police shooting position, you know. So I, I set my stance. Uh, I took a good stance, uh, weight forward. I brought the weapon up to eye level. 
found the front sights, found the target, adjusted it and fired, you know, and I could see where the round hit, the round hit the, the seat of the car. And I was really ticked at myself. I was so pissed. And I, how could I, how could you miss an easy shot like that? So uh, I took two steps forward, set my position again, found the sights, found the side picture, side alignment, and boom, fired. And I, that hit the subject in the head, shot number two. Took two steps forward, concentrated on the, on the, passenger because that's the one i thought the driver was dead because i i saw him recoil from a shotgun blast to the to the side windshield the the pass the driver's side windshield i mean a, a car car glass so i thought that the, the shot 12 pellets had you know popped him in the head and shoulders you know stuff but in reality nothing hit him you know so so but I didn't know that at the time, so I thought the passenger was the one that was more likely alive. So I concentrated on the drive on the passenger, shot him once, took two steps forward, shot him a second time, took two steps forward, shot him a third time. And by that time, I'm at the, the car door. I had one round left, so I said, eh, what the heck, you know. So I uh, just put it in the driver's oh. chest area, and um, that's the round that it hit him up in the upper chest area, and he was leaning back like this. The round goes up his torso and hits him in the spinal cord. So um, at that point, he's paralyzed, totally paralyzed from the neck down. And that was pretty much the end of the gunfight because, uh, and it, it helped, my, my actions helped because what happened was Gil Arantia and Ron Reiser came running across the street. Uh, Reiser was on my right and, and Arantia was on my left, you know, and they came in to reinforce me. And uh, that's when uh, Ron Reiser, I remember him saying, Ed, put your gun away, it's over. So, you know, <laughs> I still I still laugh to this day because I remember bringing my, my gun back, you know, like, like you're supposed to, you know, you don't wave the barrel left or right or up or down, you know, I just brought the gun back like this and then I aimed the, 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 the muzzle down at the ground. I put the, <laughs> the revolver in the holster and I snapped the holster with my hand like this. That's a hundred thousand times of muscle memory and I snapped the holster. And then I backpedaled about three or four or five steps and I collapsed, you know, back before I started my my move on the car. And that was pretty much the end of the gunfight. Yeah, I remember. I think it's from the video that the FBI training video that, that uh, you guys made where and it, it's exactly the way it looks. If I remember correctly, you finish firing and here comes rising around and they're on you almost instantaneously or right. so it would seem. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because, you know, I, you know, it became obvious to me when I'm, if I, if, when I look North and South, you know, I'm thinking, man, they got a perimeter set, but nobody's coming in to help us. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking we are going to die, you know, help that must have, that, that <laughs> mu yeah, that, that sense of powerlessness in that moment, like, look, the cavalry's here, but get your butts over here. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, it's like, you know, and it was it was a conscious effort on my part. I mean, I could, not an effort, a conscious decision. It's like, man, you know, I got to do something. You know, I, I just, I mean, I just, if we stay here, I mean, I was already thinking I was a dead man, you know, and I'm thinking if, if we wait another 30 seconds or a minute, I will be a dead man, you know, yeah. because... What what your audience has to understand is that this wasn't your ordinary run of the mill gunfight. Uh, an, an, an average run of the mill gunfight is over in ten or fifteen seconds, probably less than ten seconds. You know, yeah. bang, bang, bang. You know, and it's done. Okay, this gunfight lasted over four minutes. You know, um, yeah. one hundred and fifty shots were fired, estimated one hundred and fifty shots, and I say estimated because um, let me give you an example. Ron Reisner fired. Uh, one and a half magazines of uh, nine millimeter ammo. That's 15 rounds plus seven. That's uh, carry the one. Okay. No, <laughs> that's 22 rounds. He fired approximately 22 rounds from his nine millimeter. When the crime scene was done, they only found about nine of his shell casings. And you may ask why? Well, from where he was shooting, uh, they told him to move his car back so that a medevac helicopter could land right on the spot where he was had parked to medevac the agents uh, to a hospital. So you can imagine the, the prop wash, you know, from a helicopter coming down on a crime scene. It just blew everything that kingdom come, you know. So they only found uh, nine of his shell casings when in reality he fired 22 shots. And the same thing for... Um, 
for uh, Ben Grogan and Jerry Dove. Okay, Jerry fired two full magazines, and Ben, I, I think Ben, based on the on the rounds that were in left in his uh, magazines, Ben only fired about ten or twelve shots. Okay, so um, I don't know if they found all his shell casings, but I know they did not find all of Jerry Dove's shell casings. So. From the shell casings they found, they found 120 shell casings and all the other missing shell casings, you know, they, they figured, okay, you know, it had to be about 150 rounds, you know, because they didn't find all the Platts shell casings either. You know, he, he fired uh, 60 shots from the uh, Mini-14 and I don't think they, they only found like 40 some odd uh, casings. So I remember correctly, uh, Rosner is the only one that's not wounded. Every other agent is wounded or killed, and then the two bad guys are killed. Is that right? Correct, right. You know, it's amazing. You know, but you know, he 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 deserved a chance. You know, the, the guy did two tours in Vietnam as a Marine Corps captain. You know, he never got wounded there, and he, you know he <laughs> he comes to Miami and they say, well, you know what? Maybe he shouldn't be wounded here either. You know, but it's amazing. But you're absolutely right. Out of, there were ten direct participants in the gunfight. Eight agents and two two uh, two bandits, you know, two robbers, and uh, out of the ten participants, nine were either wounded and or killed. You know, so that's a ninety percent hit rate if, wow. if you if you look at it. You know, and uh, you know, some of us were wounded uh, uh, twice. Like Gordon McNeil was shot twice. John Hanlon was shot three times. I uh, I was shot twice. Um, and Ben Ben Grogan was shot twice. Jerry was shot three times, um, and uh, uh, Richard Manauzi and uh, Gilbert Arantia were not shot. I mean, they, they didn't take rifle hits, but they took uh, shrapnel hits from uh, ricocheting rounds and, and and car doors exploding and stuff like that. So, uh, lucky for them, you know, they uh, especially Arantia, he was in the car and rounds start coming through the. the uh, the dash of the, of the car exploding into his face. You know, he's lucky he wasn't blinded, you know, I mean, cause I mean, you, even the tiniest little grain of sand flying into your eye is not a good day. Okay. No matter, no matter what you, you, you say, you know, so. So th that began the, uh, you know, the recovery phase for you physically and maybe emotionally uh, surviving that incident and for every agent involved. But it also started a, a fact finding mission for the Bureau to how do we prepare for the next time we run up against committed armed felons like this? Am I correct in that? Yes. You know, I, I think that's that's a pretty fair assessment, you know, um, but. You know, I mean, law enforcement in general, you know, they, they know that, you know, there are people like this out there, you know, so, uh, but it, what what happened though, it, this led to the uh, the research into ballistics, you know, which I described earlier, and it, it led it, uh, it definitely led to a change in, uh, in weapons. Okay, I, I, I've been asked, well, why weren't you better armed? It's like, dude, I want to keep my job, you know, I mean, <laughs> Right. I was only authorized to carry a, a 38 caliber revolver. Okay. And that's per departmental policy. Okay. I would have loved to have carried a, a, a Thompson submachine gun, you know, especially on that day. But if I do that, I am going to get fired. You know, I mean, I, I cannot, you, uh, an officer cannot carry unauthorized weapons or ammo. Okay. That's the best way to get fired, you know, and sued. You know, so, <clears throat> you know, we were all carrying everything that we were legally authorized to carry. And uh, what happened as a result of this incident was that um, the uh, the change from revolvers to semi-automatic high capacity pistols. OK, uh, I, I, I told I tell people, I said, hey, you know what, for me to fire 30 rounds, I would have to shoot and reload five times. Okay, whereas Platt had a 30 round magazine, he he could fire 30 shots without having to reload. Okay, I would have to reload five times. Okay, so that that the changing the change to high capacity pistols was a tremendous change for law enforcement. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that you stop practicing or, or that doesn't mean that you stop, you know, following good tactics or you know and stuff like that. You know, it just means that you know the advantage goes to, you know, it doesn't go to the bad guys anymore. It, it's pretty much an even level playing field, you know. And then on top of that, the uh, the law, the Bureau, I don't know about local law enforcement agencies, but the Bureau went out and bought um, 
I think they went out about 5,000 uh, H&K MP5 uh, semi-automatic, uh, not full automatic, semi-automatic uh, submachine guns to issue uh, to agents, <clears throat> even though that's a, a pistol cartridge, it's still a 30 round magazine. <clears throat> and then they also bought about 5,000 shotguns. So they, they had enough weapons to issue each uh, pair of agents, each every two agents, they had enough weapons to issue a shotgun and or an MP5. And then the FBI also uh, permitted the uh, agents to purchase their, their personally owned assault uh, uh, AR-15s. So I went out and bought one right away, you know, so. And you know, I, I found out that from my, from my, uh, from some re recently re uh, graduated agents, <clears throat> the FBI has done away with shotguns. They don't no longer issue shotguns to agents now. They only issue uh, uh, AR-15s or, or uh, M4s to agents now. Uh, that, um, you know, that, that, it's good, but it also carries a little bit of a responsibility. You really, truly have to know where the hell you're aiming and shooting that gun, man, because that two to three round, you know, at 3,000 plus feet per second, you know, and you got to make sure you know what you're shooting at and, and where it's going because, you know, that round could go on for miles, you know, and, and, and end up somewhere you don't want it, you know, so. Yeah, but it also, so it, it the technology changes, equipment changes, maybe communications change, everything changed because of that gunfight. But also if I, if I remember correctly, when you were doing that, um, you know, the, the reloading the shotgun w with one injured hand, it's something you had never trained before. Am I correct in saying that? That is absolutely correct. You know, people have, have asked me, where the hell, what did you learn? And I'm thinking, dude, you know, I mean, it just came to me. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, if, if you see, that's why we have training. And that's why I'm so, such a big proponent and, and, and advocate of training, 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 training. Okay. If, if an agency isn't, isn't, uh, isn't out doing work, they should be training one or the other, you know, but, um, when, when I was in that, that stress position and life or death. Okay. I, I, I did have training, Marine Corps training and FBI training, law enforcement training. So I had a base to build on, but, from that base, you know, it, it offered me, in other words, I wasn't starting from, from zero. I was starting somewhere up around 40 or 50, you know, percent, you know, I, I had something to base you know, some, you know, to reach, I had some reach back, I, I guess they call it in the military. Uh, you know, what, what works, what doesn't work, you know, what, what, what are some options? Okay. And it, you'd be amazed under real stress, you know, what, what goes through your mind, you know, and people say, hey, listen, you know, I, I experienced uh, tunnel vision and slow motion and and this and that and the other thing. Well, you, you know what slow motion is? Slow motion is the fact that your mind is moving and thinking so fast that uh, it literally appears that you are moving in slow motion. That is how fast your mind accelerates. Okay, to try to get your stupid ass out of trouble, you know, that you got yourself in. Okay, that, I mean, that's what slow motion is all about. Okay, it's the fact that your mind, your mental capacity has like, it's quintupled, it's light speed. It literally is like light speed. You are moving. I went through so many options, you know, you know, what about this? What about this? And I probably went through 20 options in, in the blink of an eye. And, and I'm discarding discarding options, options, and, and, and you may not even realize it. But, I mean, I realize it now, okay, because I was going through options, scanning, 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 you know, that's, that's not going to work. Or, okay, you've got a bum left arm, you're bleeding to death, you know, that's not going to work. You're scanning, scanning. And then suddenly something came up to me. It's like, hey, you know what? This could work. Okay, because I had never considered shooting a shotgun one-handed. I mean, I, I had, you know, as a joke maybe. But I never actually did it on a range, you know. And you know what? I think everybody from going forward should probably experience that one-handed. Put a put a shotgun up to your shoulder one-handed, and 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 shoot it. And I double dog dare you. Take a shotgun out at, at arm's length, with a, a just a one-handed grip on the on the on the on the pistol grip of a shotgun. I only load one round. Yeah. <laughs> Only low one round because you, you're going to be surprised what happens to that shotgun when you fire it one-handed. 
Okay, it's not going to stay in your hand. It's amazing that it stayed in my hand when I fired it one-handed. Again, but I had a death grip on the, on, the, on, the, on the gun. I had like superhuman strength going because of the fight or flight. Okay, but I double dog dare you to go on a range and load one shotgun, 12 gauge shotgun round into a shotgun and stick it out at, at arm's length and fire it, see what happens. Okay, <laughs> then you'll know it's like, hey, you know what? Maybe I need more practice. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And, uh, so the, the FBI, you know, they, you, you guys work on that and we're coming up on two hours, Ed. So I want to be respectful of your time. We might have to do round three because I still didn't get to the questions and I really wanted hey, to you talk know what, to though? you. About. As long as you keep sending me chocolates, man, I'm, I'm here. Absolutely. You know, I love, brother. I love those, uh, those, those Godiva chocolates you send me. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, right? <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm going to, don't worry about it. Uh, no, hey, listen, I'm, I'm at your disposal, you know, as long as your audience is interested, you know, I mean, that, that's why I do this, you know, because, I mean, there is still interest out there. And I really, truly, you know, I, I think maybe one thing I say in, in a two hour, you know, gab session, if I could say one thing that can help save an, an officer's life, it's worth it. You know, I mean, it's, it's worth it. It's worth my time, you know. Well, I appreciate that because I personally, you know, conducted my law enforcement tactics with your lessons in mind. You know, when I was uh, doing PSD overseas, uh, guarding folks, I was looking back to the lessons that you and your officers learned that day. So you've made an impact in my life. And I know that those that hear your story and read your book, you're going to make an impact in their life and you're, you're saving lives more than, more than you can imagine. So it, well, it's thank amazing. You. Thank you, Rich. I really appreciate it. I mean, that's, that's the reason I do it. You know I mean? I, uh, well, actually, it was twofold. You know, the, the first reason was that there were so many misconceptions out there. Hey, you guys weren't planning. You guys were stupid. You guys, you know, were unprepared. I said, dude, I mean, where, where, where are you getting this from, you know? And, uh, you know, uh, you guys, you know, you, I even had somebody say, you, 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 uh, you, you had bad shot placement. Duh. When you're shooting at a at a moving target, pal, I mean, you, you know, you're lucky you could get a hit on a moving target, you know, and a target that's shooting back at you, it, it ho puts a whole different perspective on things. So there were so many so so many misconceptions and so many uh, rumors out there that you know it really was maddening to me because it's like you know what people got the story wrong, you know. So I I wanted to set the record straight, and I and I I am and I always try to be as candid and honest as possible because. I'm not going to sugarcoat something, you know, because I, well, you know, I think, well, this is this is what they want to hear. No, I want you to hear the truth, because I want this to help you. I don't want you to have some misconception out there that, well, you know what? If I do this, you know, I'm bulletproof. No, you're not. You know, you're you're not. No one's bulletproof, and and no one gun, no one bullet is is a magic bullet. I mean, time and chance, time and chance happen to us all. Okay, and you have to understand that, and you have to plan accordingly. But the, the key here is training, 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 and planning. I mean, you got to have those two components, you know, and you got to have a little bit of cojones, you know, to go with that too. And ladies, whatever the, the, the whatever that is for women, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> Tony says this happened when I was on the SWAT team. We got to see training videos a couple of years after that, and made a huge difference and difference in our tactics. Great, <clears throat> great deal. Yeah, and you know. Uh, that you could easily say, well, you know, stuff on a square range really doesn't matter, you know, because listen to Ed's story, you know, and that there's people moving and they're shooting back. But I want to say that there are some things that we can learn from the square range, you know, just good muzzle discipline on your part probably kept you from shooting yourself in the foot when you're don't muzzle yourself coming out of the car. You don't muzzle yeah. uh, McNeil's yeah. back, J little stuff like that, using the amount of cover that you had to, to make the good shots. I mean, there, there's, that good stance that you talked about and getting good side alignment side pictures, you're shooting them in the face. That's good yeah. stuff, Ed. But you know what though? Uh, again, you know, I, I don't want there to be a, a you know, a misconception. And I mean, I, I, this incident also changed uh, range training. I mean, that's kind of a loose term. Uh, when I, when I was training, you know, we had a lot of inline training, you know, you shoot in lines, you know, you shoot, you know, you you know, you shoot 40 people in a row, you know, together and stuff. That's important, okay? But after this incident, the, the, the Bureau and Law Enforcement in general say, you know what, we also need, we need, we need to increase our combat training, what we call combat courses. You know, 
shooting from cars, shooting at moving targets, shooting at multiple targets, shooting into a car, you know, shooting, you know, the FBI went at, uh, the, to, to shooting from inside a car with uh, uh, handguns and, and long weapons, okay? And maneuvering in a car when you have a seat belt on and you're in the driver's seat and you have to escape to the passenger side, dude, if you've never tried it before, depending on the configuration of your car, it is a freaking pain in the ass to get out of that car. And that's the type of, of training, realistic training that law enforcement officers have to experience. It's better to experience it on a range than on the street when you're getting your shot, your putt shot off, you know. But getting back to the range, probably one of the most difficult courses that I've fired, and, and probably one of the best courses that helped me personally, I don't know about anybody else, is a bullseye course. Okay, that is a marksmanship course. Okay, you need to have the basic fundamentals of marksmanship. And I would insist and, and encourage uh, everyone to shoot at a bullseye, okay, within the, the, the set parameters, the, the time parameters and, and the distance parameters. Because you know what? If your marksmanship is off, it, that course is unforgiving, okay? Uh, shooting the standard police bullseye, bullseye course, 25 yards, 15 yards. You know, you fire slow fire, you fire at, at 25, you fire slow fire at 15, wow. and you fire rapid fire at 15. I'm telling you, wow. that will that that course will tell you exactly what kind of a shooter you are, okay? And it, it's unforgiving. And, and that's great because you, you need to know the basic fundamentals oh. of marksmanship first before you can start shooting out of cars, jumping out of airplanes with two guns and shooting over your shoulders and behind your back. You, you can't do that unless you have the basic fundamentals of marksmanship down first. Okay, everything else is built up on top of that. So you got to have both. But, you know, I, I really, I really, uh, am really happy that uh, at least within the FBI, we started shooting, you know, realistic courses, you know, where do gunfights happen? If you're a patrol, if you're a highway patrol officer, it, they happen around cars. So you should train around cars, train from, you know, train shooting from inside a car train shooting into a car, you know, windshields and car doors and all this other stuff, you know, where, where do SWAT team members, uh, you know, get in shootings you know, around cars, around buildings, around doors, you know, I mean, all out in the woods, I mean, everything, you know, so you need to practice everything. And at some point in time, you, you need to experience everything. I'm so glad you said that. I mean, that's a perfect place to probably wrap it up. And, and I'm so glad, I mean, you're, if you're listening to this in a podcast or you're watching it on YouTube or wherever you're going to watch it in the future, listen to what Ed just said, you know, it starts with that basic fundamentals of marksmanship on that B8 target, yep. slow fire. So you can hone those skills yep. because it's been my experience as a firearms trainer. Everybody wants to jump right into the, yeah. To, to jumping out of vehicles and doing ninja rolls and all this yeah. other crap. And it's like, dude, when I put you on a B8 target, you can't hit it from five yards away. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, that target is unforgiving. I mean, you know, you either have the basic marksmanship skills or you don't. And if you don't, you need to get them. I mean, you can't start shooting, you know, two guns at a time, you know, flying out, you know, jumping out of a car, you know, doing somersaults until you get the basics first. <laughs> but it seems like everybody wants to, when they spend their training dollars, you know, the civilian community is like, I want to do the ninja stuff. It's like, bro, whoa, slow down. <laughs> we got to get yeah. you there, man. And yeah. you're not ready for that. Yep. 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 Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's not that expensive. You know, it's only 30 rounds, a 30 round course, you know, from 25 and 15 yards. You know, it, 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 you, should, you know, you should talk to somebody who shot it or, or look online. It's not not that it's not that many round. Uh, it's not so ammunition intensive. OK, 30 shots. But I'm telling you, man, at the end of that round, at the end of that course, you're going to man, I suck. Or, man, you know, I'm a pretty good shot. You know, I, I understand this. But more than likely, you're going to say I suck. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I think it was, you know, it was basic marksmanship that, uh, you know, that allowed uh, Dove to get those good hits on oh, target. Absolutely. That, that allowed absolutely. you to get good hits on I target. Mean, Jerry, Jerry could not have made that. I mean, I'm telling you, that was a million dollar shot. Jerry could not have made that shot unless he had the basic fundamentals of marksmanship down. I'm telling you, he shot, uh, uh, he had a th three foot wide window and the target was moving from left to right. Okay. And he made a center mass hit. You know, perfect shot, perfect shot. 
That's incredibly impressive what you and those officers did that day and how you changed uh, the lives of everybody. I mean, when I look back on the all the, the gunfights of the 20th century, you know, there's the New Hall yeah. uh, massacre, which yeah. unfortunately all four uh, officers were killed. If you haven't familiar with that, please go back and look at it. And then in the, your gunfight, those are the two seminal moments where we learned everything that we take for granted today. And I want to thank you, Ed, for your service. Yeah. And uh, thank you for coming on the show today. Well, thank you, Rich. You know, and uh, just for the audience, for the sake of audience, that's this is not my bedroom behind me. Okay, I, I'm traveling. I'm in a hotel, and, and I couldn't choose my background. So don't don't judge me too harshly out there. Okay, thanks, Rich. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, and I, I want to get you some chocolate so I can get you on here around three. Ed. <laughs> thanks, guys. Okay, everyone, take care. Be safe and and practice, practice, practice. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys.